Last month, I sent blood for epigenetic analysis. So with that in mind, what's my biological age? In this video, we'll cover epigenetic data for three tests, Hanum, Dunedin Pace, and Horvath. And that data was generated by the company True Diagnostic. If you're measuring your own epigenetic data, there'll be a True Diagnostic dis discount link in the video's description. Now, in an earlier video for each of these epigenetic tests, I presented their correlation with chronological age and their association with all-cause mortality risk. So I won't go into that in this video. If you're interested in seeing that data, that video will be in the right corner, so check it out. But in this video, we'll identify what's good, what's bad, and then are there potential contributing factors to my epigenetic data. So first up is the Hanum Extrinsic Epigenetic Age Acceleration, or EEAA, and the Hanum test is a marker of immune system aging. So for the October test, we can see that my Hanum epigenetic age was 40 years, which is 10 years younger than my chronological age. Now, superficially, 10 years younger than my chronological age is good news, but this data isn't as good as my Hanum age for test number one and test number two. And we can see that here. First, in the May test, on the May test, we can see that my Hanum age was 36.87 years, which is 12 years younger than my chronological age. And then for test number two, my Hanum epigenetic age was 37.47 years, which also was 12 years younger than my chronological age. So for this most recent test, it was two to three years older when compared with tests one and two. So some good news, but also some bad news. Next up, Dunedin Pace. So Dunedin Pace is data that was generated from the Dunedin study, and Pace refers to the pace of aging calculated from the epigenome. So my Dunedin Pace epigenetic age was 0.89 for this October test. So what does that mean? So on the left, we've got the slowest epigenetic aging rate of 0.6, and what that means is that for every one year of chronological age, epigenetic age increases by 0.6 years. Conversely, 1.4 would be the fastest epigenetic aging rate. And that means that for every one year of chronological age, epigenetic age increases by 1.4 years. So a Dunedin pace value of 0.89 years is good news for this test, but it's not as good as the data that I got for tests one and two. And we can see that here. First for the May test, my Dunedin pace value was 0.8. And then for the July test, it was 0.82. So once again, some good news, but then also some bad news. But now the worst news of them all is my Horvath data. So what we're gonna see is Horvath's Intrinsic Epigenetic Age Acceleration, also known as IEAA, and the Horvath test is a marker of cell intrinsic aging. So for the October test, for this most recent test, we can see that my Horvath epigenetic age was 56.34 years, which is seven years older than my chronological age. So this is my worst Horvath epigenetic age data over the past three tests, which also weren't very good. For example, for test number one in May, we can see that my Horvath epigenetic age was 55, which was six years older than my chronological age. And then similarly, although it was a relatively better result, for the July test, my Horvath epigenetic age was 53.5 years, but still it was old, four years older than my chronological age. So I've got some room for improvement, a lot of room for improvement with my Horvath epigenetic age. Now, the next question then is, how can I reduce my epigenetic age using Horvath's test and get best, back to my best data, not just for Horvath, but for the other epigenetic tests? Now, a big part of my approach is looking at correlations, so I don't yet have enough epigenetic data. This is only three tests. Uh, once I get to about five tests, I'll start looking at correlations, but I can potentially gain insight by comparing differences for a, a certain amount of time before each test and comparing to see if there are differences test to test for that period. So more specifically, what was different for the 30 day period prior to test two and three? So first starting off with body weight, this is again, 30 days before each test. I weigh myself every morning after using the bathroom. So after going number one and number two. So for the test number two, my average body weight was 151 and a half pounds. Whereas for test number three, it was 152.2 pounds. Now, just besides looking at averages between two groups of data, when comparing them with the two sample t-tests, these two groups of data are significantly different. So in other words, my body weight was significantly higher prior to test number three relative to test number two. But that, that, that then raises a, uh, an interesting question, is a small body weight increase enough to worsen epigenetic age? And also, is body weight the only factor that may have affected epigenetic age? So to evaluate that, I looked at 93 vari vari variables for the 30-day period prior to test two with test number three. And those variables include cardiovascular metrics, 
sleep sleep uh, metrics, so total sleep and individual sleep stages. And both of those data, CV metrics and sleep, are generated by my fitness tracker, macro and micronutrients, and individual food amounts. As we all know, I track diet. So 93 variables compared for the 30-day period before test number two with test number three. And we can see what's, what's significant here when looking at test number two on the left versus test number three on the right. So uh, just uh, to introduce uh, the st what's statistically significant or not here, obviously we've got the p-value, but as a quick sidestep, side with a p-value less than 0 0.05 as the threshold for significance, we can expect to see one false positive, at least one false positive per 20 comparisons. So when we have 100 com comparisons as almost 93 is pretty close to 100 in this case, we could expect five false positives. So to account for that, we can uh, include a false discovery rate or compute the false discovery rate, which is also known as an adjusted p-value. So computing the FDR accounts for this issue of multiple comparisons. So in, what we're looking at here in this table are variables that were different with a p-value less than 0 0.05, but then also with a relatively strict false discovery rate of 0 0.1. So what's significantly different? We can obviously see that body weight was different uh, as shown on the left, but also on the table from test number two to test number three. But then atop the list, we can see Brazil nuts and more specifically selenium, which is uh, my largest source of uh, uh, Brazil nuts contain a, a large amount of selenium. So I'm getting most of my daily selenium from Brazil nuts. That was significantly different from test number two to test number three. Now, whether that's impacting epigenetic age, I don't know, but I plan on keeping my Brazil nut and selenium intake relatively higher uh, or higher than they were for test two for test number four. So uh, we'll see if that if, if this is correlation or causation. Also significantly different for the 30-day period prior to these two epigenetic tests were my cardiovascular fit, fitness metrics, resting heart rate, RHR, and heart rate variability, HRV. Uh, and these both of these are going in the wrong direction and in, in conjunction with worse epigenetic data. So for the resting heart rate, we can see that that went up from 44 to 45.5, and the heart rate variability went down from 65 to about 59. So worse cardiovascular fitness metrics, uh, relatively worse epigenetic age, at least uh, by correlation. Then also we can see that uh, sleep was different for each of these 30-day periods prior to these two tests, but not how, you, how you'd expect. For example, both light sleep and total sleep were significantly higher prior to test number three for the 30-day period relative to test number two. So for test uh, number two versus three, we can see that light sleep was 2.9 hours versus 3.5 hours for test number three. So I got more light sleep, but somehow uh, worse epigenetic age. And similarly, total sleep was also 7.6 versus 7.2. Now, also, we can see that calories were significantly different for the 30-day period prior to these two tests, but also, again, not as one would expect. In fact, uh, calorie intake was significantly lower prior to test number three, which is arguably my worst epigenetic data. One would expect that a higher calorie intake would be associated or correlated with uh, worse epigenetic data, but for at least for these two tests, that's not the case. But the biggest uh, trend or pattern in these data seems to be related to fat intake. So with all the red arrows, we can see Brazil nuts, monounsaturated fatty acids, MUFA, total nuts and seeds, peanuts, and then at the bottom, total fat. Each of these were significantly higher uh, for the 30-day period prior to test number three versus test number two, which suggests that uh, total fat intake may be worse or, or, or bad for my epigenetic age. Now, to test that for the next epigenetic test, I'll reduce my fat intake uh, from below about 87 grams per day for test number three, somewhere closer to 81 grams per day, which is what my test number two value was. And if correlate, correlation equals causation, uh, if epigenetic age improves in conjunction with a reduced fat in intake, that would add some strength to that hypothesis. But then the key is, will I improve epigenetic age with a relatively lower fat intake without messing up all the other blood biomarkers? So stay tuned for that data. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, those discount links that I mentioned, including epigenetic testing, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing, diet tracking, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.